And joining us now on the line from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Kathleen Martin. She is author of Kamaqui, Finding Peace, Love and Injustice in Sierra Leone. And Kathleen, it's good of you to join us from Halifax. How are you tonight? I'm great. Thank you for inviting me. We're happy to have you on the program. Uh, Sierra Leone is a long way away from the province of Ontario, so I want us to start by just having you tell us a bit about that civil war that lasted for more than a decade, cost 50,000 people their lives. What in heaven's name was it about? Well, um, it was about an, a number of things, but as I think in general is the case with civil wars, what it becomes about is, is people being very angry at one another. Um, one of the, the responses to that civil war ultimately when they came back and took a look at it was that it was Sierra Leoneans fighting Sierra Leoneans. Um, but the causes become mixed up. Ultimately, it was a, uh, Sierra Leone was a state that had failed. Um, the people were as poor as it's possible to be. The government had stopped supporting social programs, the health care system, the education system. There was endemic corruption. And so you had a very distraught people who, um, particularly a group of youth who felt hopeless, who felt that there was uh, a really profound sense of despair and no sense of a future for themselves. Um, and they got, um, they wanted to, they were being oppressed by the government and uh, they really wanted to fight back. They wanted to reclaim the country. A lot of, they knew a lot of the riches of the country, particularly the diamond mines um, were going elsewhere, weren't being reinvested into their country. So there were all kinds of reasons uh, that they began the fight. The rebel soldiers began the fight, but they were ultimately preyed upon by other factions um, in West Africa and other parts of the world, um, primarily through Libya, or excuse, through Libya was one of them, but also through Liberia um, and Charles Taylor, who we'll be talking about later today as well. Uh, actually, we're going to talk about him right now, because to the extent that people know about this, I suspect Charles Taylor is a name they know because he was just found guilty uh, at the uh, International Criminal Courts of uh, Crimes Against Human war, war Crimes in any event. Uh, tell us about the role he played in this conflict. Well, Charles Taylor um, was one of the people responsible for the war, the civil war that was taking place concurrently in Liberia, which is a neighboring country to Sierra Leone. And he had an interesting role to play. Um, basically, before the war uh, erupted in Sierra Leone, he was involved with training the rebel soldiers um, and in fighting tactics. And so he was involved early on, um, not as an instigator for the war, but certainly as a support to the idea of the rebels um, overthrowing the current government in Sierra Leone. He was at that time not entirely pleased with the Sierra Leonean government because they had been supporting um, the ECMOG group of uh, West African states um, who were, who were um, stopping or attempting to stop some of what uh, he was doing at that time in Liberia, um, what Charles Taylor was doing in Liberia. So he had a reason to not be pleased with Sierra Leone's government at the time. And also he had this vision of a greater Liberia. And so Sierra Leone, which as I said is neighbor to Liberia, was part of that picture in his mind. Sierra Leone also has uh, very rich diamond mines. I'm sure lots of people are aware of that. Mm -hmm. And they could then fund um, Taylor's work. But so he's also a guy, I think, Kathleen, who taught soldiers to cut people's hands and limbs off when they yeah. got in their way, which is one of the reasons he's in front of the ICC. Yeah, and he, you know, one of the things that was so chilling about this war is, is the level of atrocity that took place there, or the level of the atrocities that took place, and how heinous um, the acts were. And I think that's one of the things that's really difficult to understand. When you talked earlier about the causes of the Civil War, what happened, um, what they were fighting about, the problem with this Civil War um, is that people were doing terrible things to each other on both sides. So it was really difficult in the end. It's a very complicated story. And it was very difficult in the end to sort of pick one good guy and one bad guy. It wasn't that clean cut. And I think in our minds as people in North America, we often imagine that when it comes to a war. So it's really easy to, to be um, angry at one side in particular. But both all, all factions in this war did really awful things to people, including, as you were talking about, cutting off arms and hands um, and feet and other, uh, certainly lots of other parts of the bodies, but also terrible things that were done, um, crimes uh, against children, conscripting them into the army uh, as child soldiers, lots of uh, sexual crimes, um, forced marriage for girls, rape, uh, routine rape, um, lots of violence in that respect as well, displacement. It, it, the list is really quite horrifying. Okay, with that hellacious history now in place, let's talk about what actually took you to the African continent and in particular Sierra Leone. What took you there? I got a phone call. It was one of those amazing things that happens in life. I picked up the phone. Someone had uh, from World Hope uh, Canada, which is a nonprofit charitable organization. They were uh, had gotten a grant from uh, CETA in Canada, um, and they had uh, money to send a journalist across uh, the Atlantic Ocean to West Africa, where Sierra Leone is, to research child poverty. And I was the, the lucky journalist that they picked to do that. Um, and it was literally a call out of the blue. They had heard about some other work that I had done and invited me to go. And 
you know, it was, it was a strange phone call because she said, would you like to go to Sierra Leone, you know, to research <laughs> child poverty? And I said, sure. And she's like, okay, we're leaving in, you know, six weeks. <laughs> and you'd never been there before, I guess. I had never been there before. And did you know much they, about it? I didn't. I knew very little about it, although I was aware of the conflict. And what particularly interested me about it and why I was able to say yes so quickly was that I had, um, I was really interested in how countries existed after a war, what happened post-conflict, how did they put themselves back together again. And I knew that there had been the civil war there. I was also very interested in the use of children in conflict, um, and I knew that that had occurred in Sierra Leone as well. But I didn't know a lot other than that. I also, um, I did know that it was a very poor country, and I had a long interest um, from the time I was a child in, in the developing world and, and what happens in those situations. And this organization, World Hope Canada, what do they do? They work to alleviate poverty. They work to help, uh, particularly in places like Sierra Leone. They're also involved in the Democratic Republic of Congo. They're involved heavily as well in Ukraine, helping street children in Ukraine um, as well. So they do lots of those things. And one of the great things about their work in Sierra Leone, from my perspective, World Hope Canada is a group that's involved also with World Hope International. So there are a number of different arms but, uh, of that organization. But they've been in Sierra Leone over the long haul. So what happens after a conflict and, or during a conflict is a place becomes very interesting to NGOs because there's lots of money. You know, we saw this happen particularly, for example, most recently in uh, Haiti, um, where everybody goes because it's a place that's very popular. Um, but what I like about World Hope is that they haven't left, that they were there before hmm. the conflict, they stayed throughout, and they're still there. Because one of the, you know, a lot of the people I spoke to um, when I was in Kamakwe, which is a small town in Sierra Leone where I spent uh, the time when I was researching the book that I wrote, um, was this real fear on the part of people that they would no longer be interesting to the West. They hmm. would no longer longer be interesting enough for us to send uh, aid money, for us to care, to go over to try and help, um, that being desperately poor at the very bottom of the human develop development index wasn't enough anymore. So I love that World Hope has stayed. Hmm. I am looking at your book right now, and I must tell you, it is gorgeous. Your pictures are absolutely spectacular. And uh, I, I just want to, you know, you, you've got so many fascinating stories in here, but I want to ask you about one, Marie, okay. who yeah. suffered from malnutrition. And I'm looking at a picture of Marie, and I wonder if you could just tell our viewers a bit about Marie and her story. Marie was um, a little girl. She was an eight-year-old girl that I met in the um, feeding clinic at the hospital in Kamakwe. So I went over to Kamakwe with a group of doctors who went with World Hope Canada, um, doctors and nurses. And they had gone, two of the, one of the doctors, Heather Logan, and one of the nurses, Janet Roth, had been to uh, Sierra Leone before and had established something called the Alpha Clinic there, which is a feeding clinic in this hospital to deal with what is just rampant malnutrition. Um, Sierra Leone has one of the highest rates of deaths of children children under the age of five in the entire world. So um, this was one of the part, part of what the doctors and nurses were working on while I was there. And so I went to the feeding clinic. The first day I was there, um, I met Marie, who was this child who was um, so weak that she couldn't sit up on a bed. She mm -hmm. was, she looked like a doll that someone had forgotten. You know those dolls where the hair gets all ratted and sticks up everywhere and just looks like she's been left under the bed almost, you know. Um, and I, I went over and I was trying to help. Uh, one of the nurses was, needed me to hold her up so she could be fed. And Janet, who was uh, the nurse um, who I'd gone over, to, uh, the Canadian nurse, said, pulled me aside right away and said, Kathleen, she's going to die. And uh, I got really upset and said, I don't believe you. Not, you know, none of this has to be bad all the time. What's with you know, this sort of sad, dramatic ending that we're always trying to put on things? She's alive right now. She's at the hospital. She's going to be OK. Um, and so she did survive the whole time that I was in Sierra Leone. Um, and she had a grandmother and a father with her, and they would alternate times sitting with her. And what I learned when I was started to interview people and, and to get people's stories was that there was a, effectively a terrible custody battle taking place over Marie, um, where the father had accused the grandmother of, uh, and the grandmother's, her maternal grandmother, of, of possessing Marie, essentially, that she had been bewitched. Um, and was was sick because of bewitchment. Um, and this is in a place where access to education is so um, so rare, almost, and that the education system is so flawed at this stage um, that not everybody understands how science works or necessarily accepts that the, the science of the body is, is correct. Um, so the understanding of how malnourishment works is not always as clear as we might think it should be. Um, and so there was a feeling that she was becoming sick because she had been bewitched. And um, ultimately, uh, after I left Sierra Leone, um, and I talk about this at the beginning of the book, so it doesn't spoil anything particularly for people, I, I got an email back from Janet Roth, who had returned um, several months later, to tell me that Marie had indeed died. Um, mm -hmm. and what had 
had happened was that her father had taken her back from the hospital uh, before she was effectively cured of the malnutrition from a medical standpoint um, because he felt that the doctors weren't managing the bewitchment. They were dealing with the, the, with the malnourishment, which didn't make a lot of sense to him, but hadn't dealt with the bewitchment. And, uh, and then she died when she went home. Hmm. Kathleen, this raises a, a very, what must have been difficult issue for you, which is you're, you're essentially a children's author. Yeah. And you are writing about themes and issues which are not kid stuff. This is, no. the, the most, this is as serious as it gets in the world. And I want to know how you do what you do, how you take those themes and you kind of lay them out there in a way that people of a certain age can handle. You know, I wouldn't say this is a children's book particularly. It's quite a departure from what I normally do. Um, I had written it in hopes that people at a high school level would be able to understand it and then as well that it would be accessible to adults too. So I tried to, written, to write it in a, a way that was simple um, in terms of the le language level and that was approachable. But I think, you know, um, that people can handle things as long as they're told honestly to them, right? And I, I have a real strong belief, a really strong belief that if we expect children, for example, in our world to be soldiers, if we expect them to live in societies where they die routinely and when they watch their brothers and sisters die and later their children die of hunger, um, then we can expect our children and, and our young people to at least read about it. Hmm. How do you decide what to leave out? That's a really long process. <laughs> it takes a lot of drafts. Um, I think it was really, with this book, it, you know, it's a very short book. I wanted it to be short because I wanted people to actually read it. You know, and sometimes longer books people are more nervous about um, because I think that the stories are really important. Yeah, 175 really important. pages, just for what it's yeah, worth. With yeah, lots of pictures. You know. lots, of, lots of beautiful uh, pictures, absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, but, you know, what I, what I really wanted to do was, you know, I think it, I think what I did was take out everything I possibly could and left only what couldn't possibly not stay, you know, because hmm. um, you wanted to find out what the essence of that whole experience had been. And it's a balance between making it really readable and, and being honest. There's a lot of very sad things that happened in Kamakui while I was there. I, I was there and lots of children died while, while I was there. I heard about terrible, terrible stories of um, torture uh, for people who were involved in the war. Um, lots of really sad things. Um, but. There were so many happy things too. There was so much joy. We had so much fun while we were there. We danced and we sang and we played soccer and we um, ate amazing food and we did really great. Um, lots of just having a good time with kids and with their parents. And I didn't want to lose that too. And I really wanted people to understand that there was a lot of, of joy that was there too because I think that we forget sometimes when we're here that the joy part, part of being alive doesn't come from having the things, you know? It's not the things that make people happy. So that there's all kinds of wonderful stuff that's there as well. So we wanted to have a balance so people would actually go through the book and not just be, just be entirely sad. You know? Well, that was one of the things that struck me about your subtitle because, uh, you know, injustice is in the subtitle and I expected yeah. to find that in the book. But the whole subtitle is finding peace, love, and injustice. And I was surprised that, yes, there was peace and there was love. And we thank you for coming on TVO tonight and telling us all about it. Thank you very much for having me. Kamakui, finding peace, love, and injustice in Sierra Leone. Kathleen Martin's been our guest. Thanks so much, Kathleen. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.